but just like to welcome everybody for today's presentation, BIM 6D, BIM and sustainability. This is part two of uh, the first three-part series, uh, building performance analysis tools for early design and beyond. And today we're gonna be focusing more on the building performance analysis and more directly on the building, where in part one, we were looking at uh, the siting. So today's presentation is uh, brought to you today within our, uh, by our co-innovation lab. And within our co-innovation lab and through industry collaboration, we like to explore, and it's an ongoing process, and implement multiple methods in which BIM can make design more sustainable throughout a building's life cycle. And the reason we, uh, we like to BIM is to encourage and innovate and uh, innovate more cost-efficient designs uh, by buildings in collaboration through an integrated information exchange. So before we start today's session, I would just like to go over a quick agenda and say a few words about who we are uh, here at Microdesk. So we'll do a quick Microdesk and presenter introduction, briefly recap part one, the building performance analysis for the siting. Then we'll go ahead and do benchmarking EUI and we'll understand the path that Insight is laying out for us. And then we'll jump in with Jim and Jeffrey doing their illuminance analysis and daylighting analysis as well and let them really go into how we were able to uh, drive down this EUI and save the owner money. Um, at the very end, we'll re-benchmark and begin to um, start looking into technologies and systems uh, leading into our part three. And at the very end, if we have time, we'll have uh, uh, questions and answers at the end for you guys. So uh, Microdesk, we have been innovating project delivery for over 25 years, uh, steadily building upon our foundation. We are intent on building a sustainable future. Our services at Microdesk range from an array of workshops to project support and project management and lots, lots more. Uh, we have over 230 AEC consultants that range from registered architects, professional engineers, consultant specialists, and as well as uh, construction specialists, application developers. And additionally, we have teams dedicated to IT, asset management, and research and development. So we have the vision, the tools, and the talent to help your firm develop and deliver the cities of the future. Just a quick glance at some of the firms we already assist with. We have a wide range of skill sets and we assist all the way from the imaginations of uh, Walt Disney to Cupertino Electric to high-end design uh, firms like Foster and Partners, uh, SOM, Gensler. And we also help with nonprofits such as Built Health International and help them incorporate some of these workflows on the tighter, more obscure budgets. Just a quick look at some partners. We're an Autodesk Platinum partner. This comes with a lot of perks and benefits for us and we pass on to our clients as well. We're an IBM, Panzera, Esray, uh, Eagle Point, Enscape partner. And we are also a Bluebeam Platinum partner. Uh, gotta update this one, but we just signed a, a new deal with uh, Unity and we are also a partner with them as well. So we can bring you the more high end and um, those desirable renderings you're looking for. We have an entire team dedicated to sustainability. We are led by our fearless leader, Shivani Sony. She's uh, in charge of kicking most of this off and getting us all recruited and put us together. We also have Eve Lynn, Clark Morrison, and we have myself. Um, I'm a Revit certified professional, building performance analysis certified, and I'm just self-proclaimed uh, sustainability evangelist. To my right, we have uh, Vashuda Dixit. She is um, an excellent addition to our team and focusing on the MEP aspects right now. And she's gonna be leading part three which goes into um, the system sizing and also um, analysis from uh, Insight. Uh, today, hopefully we have with us here soon is Jeffrey Tears. He's an architectural solution specialist. He's focused on sustainability, computational design, and he's a generative design guru. We also have Jim Cohen, uh, who's gonna be joining us today as well. And Jim is a, an excellent addition to the team. He brings over 35 years of experience to the table as a sustainability evangelist and also an author as well. And he's one of the most more talented trainers and um, consultants that we have on the team. So our drive here at Mor uh, Microdesk is the GUS, uh, the globalization, urbanization, and sustainability. So our drive is to build, build upon this uh, culture at Microdesk and that revolves around transparency and encouragement. So this is enabling us as an integrated uh, digital delivery for our clients worldwide. So we hope to translate this into our culture, into our services, and into our products that we provide um, for the built environment. And we understand that you know, globalization, so technology and science will have uh, be a major driving force in the globalization and driving these standards through, across the globe, and that we're gonna grow from 28 to 43 megacities by the year 2030, thus the urbanization aspect. 
but we have to do this sustainable um, and addressing that 78% uh, of our global energy can produce and we that buildings consume 78% of our global energy and that 60% is uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. So addressing climate change is gonna require us to reimagine the built environment and support these uh, global initiatives. We recognize this as a uh, one piece to the puzzle. Sustainability is part of the BIM dimensions. As you can see, it's the sixth dimension, um, hence the name 60 for sustainability. However, we recognize that this, pro this process can be applied throughout all life cycles of the building from strategic definition to concept design, uh, technical design, construction, finally to the handover and closeout, but then reutilize that information for in-house occupancy, renovation, and or demolition if needed. So in these last couple of presentations, we've been focusing on our reduction opportunities uh, for, for the design stages. And what we're gonna be focusing on today is where we take down our design strategies. So in schematic design and de design development, we can really focus on these, where roughly 80% of our reductions are done through these stages, but we also can start engaging with the engineer to start talking about technologies and systems, giving us a further head start for the next, uh, for the next round. We try to do this within um, what's out of the box of Revit and um, Autodesk capabilities. So we can try to, um, especially for our nonprofits and other firms who don't have the excess money to buy all these extra tools, you have these capabilities within your Revit suites now to benchmark your EUI using Format, Revit, and Insight, solar insulation uh, using Revit, daylighting illuminance within Revit, interior daylighting for lead version four, renewable PV energy, as well as building envelope heat transfer, wind analysis, as well as dynamo and generative design. Utilizing all these tools, we now we know we can leverage um, all the Autodesk products to get us most of the way there for um, our analysis. But we understand that we will have need for tools external. This is including Rhinoceros and Grasshopper, Ingrid Cloud, Aurora, but we'd like to really highlight here with Light Stanza, um, adding new capabilities from tools we can explore in our lab, and involving our projects. Um, Light Stanza gives us um, a little capabilities beyond what the Autodesk products have, allowing us to go more in depth and further in our analysis to provide a little more quantitative results and outputs and reports, just like Aurora, Ingrid Cloud, or some of these other softwares you see as well. So we can keep it within the BIM and harvesting that information, but we understand there will be a need for other tools at other times, and it's about using the right tool at the right time for the right process. All right, so um, I'll go ahead and introduce just quickly the NRG Stadium and Astrodome Master Plan. Uh, kind of went into this from part one. It's a multifamily um, complex, but now becoming more of a multi-use. Uh, this mass underneath is a space saver for our part three, where we're adding in some um, commercial aspects, and it's going to be some retail space below. So we're going ahead and trying to plan for that as well. In part one, we talked about the differences between the um, in the rotation of B5. However, this rotation was a higher uh, violator of energy use. We understood there was other benefits to this rotation, such as um, providing a clean and um, comfortable environment for children to utilize this playground. And we understood that it would allow for better sight lines to the playground, and as well as protecting the uh, playground from wind, um, but also re reducing the need for uh, other structures, additional shading structures. So it's naturally being shaded by the buildings, therefore we don't need to put any awnings up. Its competitor, B5.1, was a straight orientation north-south. However, it put the playground in a very hot climate. It was getting excessive heat gain and therefore was not comfortable, didn't provide um, unobstructed sight lines, and as well was not protected in case for any winds or anything like this. So the value um, to the owner was more, uh, was, was more uh, leaned toward the playground being in a, a, a better site and more usable than the eight points that we can now start to hack off of this EUI. So after the benchmark one, we went ahead and got all of our initial use of these buildings, understanding that B5 is where we needed to focus the most and put our energy into. So after this benchmark, um, we, we, we updated the building to more realistic elements and we were able to benchmark it with the retail space underneath. Slight change in EUIs, but we really understood that we have a more refined, more um, understandable EUI that's realistic to our actual elements. 
So taking that uh, model and sending it back up into Insight. And what I want to get through here is how we understand uh, the path that Insight lays out. So I went ahead and sent each model individually up and masses for representing the other site. But let's look at B2 real quick. What this really allows us to do is understand the largest impacts versus the minimal impacts, but they all give us good information and it's encouraging us to start talking to the engineer early. We understand the impacts of our mechanical systems and uh, the way Insight works, top left, least efficient, least cost, bottom right, most efficient, most expensive. However, it's um, not always true, such as this one right here in the window glazing category. We can see that our BIM setting was uh, higher performing than a triple low E. All this was was just a standard um, double um, double pane glazing with a reflective um, tint on it. So we can tell that the reflective tint probably costs less than triple low E and is going to outperform the triple low E. So this is where we get tons of intuitive information that we can then apply and take into other softwares later. As the architectural design team, we have control over um, these kind of standards, such as lighting efficiency and plug loads, and we can really start to specify and drive these standards down. These are considered minimal impacts over here. However, um, they're very insightful still. As if you can look down at the roof construction over here, you see that uh, at a certain point, we're losing value. Uh, the more insulation we add, we're not getting any gains from it, so therefore we are wasting our money. And we can identify that point using these widgets. And just again, I wanted to look at B5. You can see that it has different impacts. However, the largest impact was now the west glazing opposed to the southern glazing, but everything else tends to fall within the same line. And we can still get that information and understand what our path going forward is going to be. So speaking about thermal values, um, this, uh, you know, as you guys know, residential housing, a lot of times they'll do um, just bat insulation and there's no continuous uh, insulation around the outside. Well, with this study on the right, in a hot climate with 35 degrees Celsius on the exterior coming through to your interior cooled space, we can see that after an hour and 20 minutes that we have a six degree Celsius change at that one stud. You multiply that stud times a thousand, you're getting heat gain from the exterior into the interior of your building. But simply with a two inch polycarbon, uh, polycarbon iso um, insulation, we understand that these thermal values are gonna be captured in this wall cavity and they won't be translated to the interior of your building, thus saving you energy on cooling and comfort levels as well. All right, Jim, are you on here? Okay, so um, I'm gonna try my best uh, to go over some of Jim's slides. Um, once again, this, you know, this was all put together by Jim Cohen amazing experience working with him on the lighting analysis. He really knows his stuff inside and out. Um, so hopefully I, I can do it serve, uh, justice. But our original study model was building five and we took that and we started making modifications. So we extended the roof to modify uh, the facade without adding awnings, trying to save money there. And then that will Joffrey will show later. Um, Microdesk engages in project work, client support and workflow evaluation and recommendations. And we develop our own software solutions like BIMRx, um, which a lot of you guys may be aware of. The best learning and training environment um, that I've experienced so far within Microdesk. Um, and our sustainability lab is a forum to develop and uh, test best practices, workflows for BIM 360 and team. And we can review and select the best fit tools for your process. Uh, these tools assess energy use, various lighting studies, wind flow analysis, and comfort zones. And other test labs can address related issues like generative design that may be used in our BIM projects and other view information, documentation, and management in the QA, QC process. So you can see from very early on, we get a 9 a.m., a noon, and three, and we can really understand how those are working together. Revit gives us the um, ability to go ahead and set these views and presets and templates that we can really start to understanding the lighting analysis and have these presets so we can redo and reiterate these, light, um, these analysis very rapidly, giving us um, a nice control over the settings so we know we have a, a very consistent and a reliable analysis. So putting a, assigning the view templates for each of the regions and the views allows you to um, generate and make this, uh, make this data and this content very rapidly and allows you to be efficient and uh, understand all your, um, all your information and settings. With these multiple batch view renderings, you can cut that time down even further and send them to the cloud and batch view all your preset views with your presettings 
to the um, Autodesk Rendering Cloud and understand them all as, as you would as a whole process. And it could be made much more efficient within the sustainability project template that we have uh, available. And this is a customizable views and content for all you guys. So within our lighting analysis, we like to look at our B5 again. This is on the fourth floor and we wanted to work the daylight to give uh, lighting levels. So we wanted to be at a mid uh, visual demand level. So in between uh, about 40 foot candles and you can see at 9 a.m., noon and 3 p.m. becomes a hot, huge violator on that uh, far side of the building. So with the multiple views in the master model, all the floors and elevations and the rendered lumens in the cloud, we were able to produce all these renderings within three to four minutes for all five buildings for all four floors and elevations. It lets us monitor changes as well as add shading devices or modify the apartment design. So we can truly understand where we're shading and not just do a prescriptive shading method. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have drive down the street and you see a building and the north side of the building has awnings all over it and or there's just shades on every single window. With our process, we can identify which rooms actually need those um, awnings and shading devices, thus saving you money off the bat. So we look at B5 fourth floor on our second pass with the roof extended. This is just a minor adjustment. It doesn't cost much extra to extend your roof. Um, and it's a simple design strategy that we can get uh, huge gains from. So you can see again at nine, noon, and three, uh, we have a little bit of benefit from that extended roof, uh, but we still have some areas that we need to address. So the second pass let us monitor the changes as well as add the devices as needed. So we can look at this from an external point as well. And we set a different scale for the exterior. It's very important. Um, you, got, you realize that when you're doing your own studies. Interior, you typically set from five to 250 uh, on a logarithmic scale. On the exterior, you're looking at a 200 um, minimum to a 10,000 maximum. So a totally different scale, but you can use this to start understanding your analysis. Landscape architects can start using this to understand their trees and how these affect um, the building's energy use and the protection it provides to the envelope, thus extending the life of the building as well. So within Revit, we are able to control um, over our visible objects, date and time and our sun settings. Um, like I said, allowing us to batch render and understand all these different um, analysis and inputs and the impacts they have and the lighting levels included with the materials as well. Within Revit, we are also able to do uh, quantitative data and understand uh, how much energy and how that translates to dollar amounts um, can be saved from the uh, surfaces. So uh, when we're looking at Jeffrey's design um, later on, we can be able to start uh, to understand and apply these kinds of studies to really get full data and understand their actual impact and put it into dollar amount. So um, Jim was uh, um, excellent with these rendering tools and he was explaining to us that these are not just for renderings, but they can be used for analysis and studies as well, as well as collaboration. Um, in our first pass, we noticed the roof was too low. So it's a collaboration point, marked it up on BIM 360. But we're able to go take a deep dive and see how these renderings play um, with the lighting levels and understand them in a little more of a human um, feel opposed to these charts and renderings that a lot of us energy modelers are used to. This can be used to speak more to a client's understanding of how the space is uh, translated and perceived. Oh, sorry about that. But not only doing that, but we can take this to the next step and start applying actual values to this and understanding um, for, for more of a synergy model is what these actual levels are in lumens. Uh, I think Jim had mentioned, or Lux, where we're trying to get these to foot candles and lumens as well. So we work with these providers to provide them feedback and get the tool adjusted so we can um, utilize it as we prefer to use it. So another great tool hitting the market is Light Stanza. Um, we see this as being the future of the lighting analysis, and we see this as going to be an industry leader in the lighting analysis. Um, and for the simple fact that it has automated outputs and it provides quantitative data rapidly, and it's very accurate. And what we can do is start to study six different iterations, uh, six, six different strategies, and right away understand which ones are working and not working. Therefore, we can go ahead and eliminate the ones that are not um, advantageous to our project 
and not even study or waste our time looking at those different strategies. Pick the ones that do the most uh, good for our project and move forward. Now we can really start to put this into real data, do a full year analysis with 26 different view directions from a grid point, as well as understanding our glare types, um, whether it's we have accessible glare or um, impermissible. So it's uh, really quantitative data that you can take, provide to a client and explain to them why your design needs A or B. As well as being able to explain it on um, a level. So in this image, we're looking at a three foot plane and we can understand which parts of the room are above the 300 lux at 50% of the time or under the 300 lux uh, threshold for 50% of the time as well. All right, um, Jeffrey, are you are you on here? All right, I see Jeffrey on here, so I'm going to change the presenter over to Jeffrey. Jeffrey, can you can you hear me? Okay. Um, I know he's on here, but I'll go ahead and try to do my best for now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Perfect. Sorry, we've been having some issues today. Um, no worries. All right, so with all the analysis tools that we've done natively in Revit, we can start to look at some of the passive design opportunities um, within the program. Whoops. Am I still presenting? I have the clicker still, Jeffrey, so just go ahead and I'll, I'll click for you. Okay. Um, all right, sorry about that. All right, we can start to look at uh, look at passive design strategies to help with the energy cost on our building itself. Um, passive design strategies speak to simple intuitive strategies designers can employ um, that can assist in cutting down that energy usage. For this, we're looking at shading devices. Um, and some of the typical shading devices that we use um, are fins, movers, and awnings. Um, for our building, this, uh, for this building, we are gonna use awnings. Um, and with the diagram shown, we have a simple three foot generic awning that we place on all facades of the building. Um, this awning will help to cut down on the summer, uh, high summer sun, so sunlight um, at a 90 degree angle. Um, and then in the window light, we can cut down or we can uh, provide more access to winter light at the lower 30 degree angle. After placing all of those, uh, after placing all of those, uh, all of those shading devices on our building, we noticed with a new benchmark provided by Luke that we had a reduction of 3.1 in EOI down to 84.4. From that, we began to look at the we began to look at computational design for uh, maximizing these solutions. First, starting with a full building study um, in Dynamo to see the installation values and confirm that our data is correct. Uh, currently, this uh, this actual study is produced at nine between nine and four p.m. Uh, in Houston, Texas, at the highest point of solar uh, solar exposure. Moving on, uh, we started to actually break down one of or some of those uh, awning systems. As I had stated before, we use the option on the right, um, option three with three foot yeah. depth. As you Jeffrey, can see, yeah. The dominator, right, brother. Um, uh, I think we're on the different slide decks, brother. I'm on the. I think we're showing the one that we just got past the winter degrees and the passive design. And just highlighted your awnings, ease of construction, cost of effectiveness, and oh, simple. Sorry, yeah. So we're going to... hey, it's not showing. Why is not presenting? Guys, they can't see your screen. Okay. Uh, show my screen. Uh, Jeffrey, I'm going to show my screen then, and we'll go from there and see if you can go back. Can you guys see that one? You're seeing the. We're seeing the, the background. Yeah. There you go. That's good. 
Thank you all. Okay. So Jeffrey, I think we last let's, uh, saw your designs about we, when you were out right here. Uh, you just got through this. So the passive design strategy, as I said, we chose a louver system, three foot depth. Um, and once again, utilizing some of the tools that we have, such as Inkscape and straight out of Revit, we were able to produce easy diagrams that we can uh, easily convey the to our clients as needed um, on the effects of our design decisions. Um, this leads to an ease of construction, uh, cost effectiveness for the design itself, and then just a simple and clean design that is typically accepted um, by most people. Uh, after such time, as I had stated before, um, after adding all the louvers on all facades of uh, B5, we were able to see a 3.1 reduction in EUI, 84.4 at this point. So we are able to see where we can save money. Um, moving forward, we began to actually look at computational design to take some of that data from uh, Dynamo and their weather analysis tool and express that on a full building study. Um, this is a solar insulation or sunlight hour study in which we can quickly visualize and it has data backing to each point on the map. So with that being said, we started to focus in and change scale down to the individual glazing um, with our three foot panel or three foot uh, shader. And you can see that we do have some nice, um, some nice shading on this surface and we can change those at any time. So moving along, we decided to take a look at um, cost of cost savings options with materiality. Um, looking at an option for a 0.5 uh, or half a foot depth um, awning, as you can see, we still get 275 solar hours um, and it's 45 square, or square foot in surface area. So yes, it is saving us some money on the materials, but unfortunately way too much solar exposure on the surface. Um, option two, 1.5 foot depth. The average solar insulation on this was 225. So we did see a um, little bit of a reduction in this uh, solar exposure. Um, and our um, surface area is at a nice manageable 66 square feet. Now, if you look at option three, our original option that we placed on the building, that uh, had a three foot depth. And as we would assume, it had a 163 uh, hours of solar exposure, but that ends up doubling our uh, surface area, which could go, uh, which could extend the cost of our project. And also with such depth, we would end up having to uh, add extra structural elements to help support it, um, especially in a high wind zone like Houston. So from generative design, or from computational design to generative design, um, we are able to quantify, um, we are able to quantify our results and manipulate those on an outcome based study method. Um, like I said, based on computational computation and data, uh, using inputs and outputs within, uh, can you click? Using inputs and outputs from our, uh, computational design script, we can set up what we need to be, what, what will be seen in general design, such as uh, the height, height and depth of our shaders at different points. And in the end, our outputs that we're looking at are, as stated before, average insulation and the surface area. So you can really start to connect your design to uh, quantitative uh, results. That being said, this is the dashboard for the interface for um, the general design in Autodesk. And on, if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see a scatter plot. Um, this scatter plot allows for us to, in the Y axis, see the average insulation. And then in our X axis, we have it set to show the um, total surface area. So as we would assume, uh, more surface area, of course, the, uh, uh, the higher or lower insulation value and the uh, least amount of surface area, a higher uh, insulation value. Next. Just to reiterate. And we also have the option to um, have a line graph that goes through and shows you exactly which parameters or inputs you placed in and how they relate to your overall design. Um, and then from there, we can also filter those results. So, one time. We can filter those results into the actual ones that we want. So, what we're looking at here is the in shader depth 
because we wanted to add a little bit of articulation to the uh, shading device itself. And then at the end of the uh, at the end of the graph, we see our average insulation values and how they relate to the um, surface area of the shader itself. Once again, as we assumed, you can see where the paths do cross in relation to each other and how they are reacting with the building itself. So to add a little bit of aesthetic value to it, we found we optimized our um, we optimized our generative design script, and we found a happy medium medium of what we wanted to see, and has some you know design qualities that allows the designers to kind of choose which ones they want based on that real world data. In option four, um, option four the depth does vary, starting at the end, it's back at I think five or half an inch, um, and then extends all the way up to two feet. Um, as you can see, solar, uh, the total solar uh, solar insulation value is about 207, with about 68 square feet of surface area, which kind of matches our um, 1.5 depth uh, generic shader. With option five, a little bit more articulated at the end, we have almost a three foot overhang, but it comes back all the way into a uh, half inch overhang. So just for that design quality, um, you know, this may not be the best choice for us. So with that in solar insulation, yes, it does meet our uh, set parameters, but once again, the constructability might not be there. Option six, same thing. Um, still, uh, we end up ex over exceeding our um, solar insulation values that we wanted to go for, and we also exceeded our surface area values. Next. So after making those design decisions and optimizing each one of those um, panels, or each one of those shaders, uh, we were able to see another almost two point reduction in our EUI, um, as well as cost, uh, saving cost on our shaders themselves. Now this could be something in which um, the, the computer is seeing that you are receiving more light than our three foot, or more light than our three foot shaders did, which could directly associate to lighting and energy cost. So that's where you can see some fluctuations uh, in your expectation of what is going on with this process. In addition to cost savings, we were able to coordinate our models in three different locations of the United States as we worked through this process. Um, and be, having the ability with BIM 360 to um, point out design issues to our colleagues and quickly get those iterate or get those fixed as soon as we possibly could. Oh, yeah, and you know, just to add to that as well, Jeffrey, um, what you're kind of alluding to there is, you know, time equals money. And that um, within a week, uh, under 40 hours between three people across uh, from California to Houston and uh, New Mexico, we were able to coordinate and do all of these analysis within 40 hours and do them efficiently and track and coordinate all these changes. So uh, this allows us to really um, show the benefits and the efficiency of these analysis and say that these are really in, um, achievable and it can be done by anybody. But just to provide a little bit more quantitative data um, to add to Jeffrey's uh, options here, we were able to reduce the predicted um, uh, cost per square foot by 13 cents just with shading. Uh, we were able to break that down and show that nine cents for adding shades took us um, and then we are also doing another four additional cents after the generative design. So the material cost, uh, taking that and material cost between three to five dollars a square foot, and we were able to reduce up to 60 square feet using the generative design, uh, design process per um, awning. So therefore, you can add all that up and start to immediately see your cost savings. So with the three foot option estimated about four hundred dollars and the one point five about two fifty. So we can really start to quantify these decisions and make the most informed decision possible. Um, going back to showing this, how our team can break down these decisions, this is a little more in depth, but I really wanted to show you that we can do these calculations, uh, taking the thermal bridging and understanding the breaks in that and how those, um, what, what kind of inference that makes. So when we're looking at these shading systems, attaching them back to the structure, like um, Joffrey mentioned earlier, we can look at the comparison of 0.98 square feet of thermal bridging can cause an increase of 0.55 EUI. So for every square foot, you almost have five and a half EUI change, and you can have a, a square foot penetration every 10 feet, depending on your awning design. Um, but this really breaks down to show you that 1,800 square feet of low-performing glazing can cause an increase of 16. 
So the ratios is where this is really important. The thermal break at 5.6 EUI per one square foot, where high performance glazing is 0 0.009 EUI per one square foot. So now your team has the data and information they can take back and make an educated best guess or best decision. So after doing all these types of strategies, we have now completed our design strategy phase and we can complete roughly 80% of our reductions through here. Um, there could be more done and there could be um, more implemented, but you know, trying to keep this as realistic as possible, we try to you know, do with, um, make real life decisions. I was also trying to integrate um, with our engineer. So we've been talking to the shooter throughout this process and discussing our mid-level um, mechanical systems. And she is now taking that into account when planning for part three. And we will show you how this takes um, how this takes place in part three, connecting all this data together, being able to use our energy model from the architects and have that provide valuable information to the mechanical engineers, saving them time and energy, as well as getting us all on the same page when talking about um, reductions. And as always, we, we do have that 20% maximum of offsite energy renewable credits, otherwise known as RECs, if you're going for these uh, initiatives. But we like to look at these two first stages and exhaust all options there first before looking to that. So with all this, guys, we want you to be able to have the faith and trust to be able to lean and work with Microdesk and be able to integrate our sustainability into strategic initiatives using our wide range of analysis software early on in the process to align and support our clients together we love to educate and advise and spread awareness when it comes to sustainability, as well as foster and promote the collaborative process within our co-innovation lab. We have dedicated research and development team here at your leisure er, for your use, and we can understand and um, identify and tackle any issues you may be having. So now we have to come together. We need to take responsibility um, as an industry and share standards, obligations, ethics, take part in credit sharing, be completely transparent, provide fresh input and have aligned goals. And these skills and knowledge sharing experience, we can discover new approaches and tools, have the competence to innovate and collaborate, be open to learn and lean on from other people such as Microdesk, and really um, understand that more is inevitable, less is reality, and there is an opportunity for better. I really hope you guys enjoyed this today. I apologize for the technical difficulties we had. Um, it was a real disservice not to be able to have Jim here. He, he would have done the lighting section much better, but hopefully we can um, edit this up and get it back out for you guys. So join us next time, uh, November 30th, same time and place. And we're gonna dive into part three and we're connecting the BPA, which is building performance analysis to the systems analysis. And you can also utilize that for design as well. So I will open it up to questions if there are any and um, feel free to reach out and contact us if, if you have any additional questions as well. All right, guys, if there's any questions, like I said, the floor is, um, floor is open. I can unmute you guys or you can type them in the chat box. Uh, yeah, yes, this is Carlos. I'm here in Houston, Texas. Uh, I work for uh, PBK and the people who is uh, and the people who who live here in Houston. They know pretty well what is the company that I'm working for. And uh, one intention that I have to participate on this uh, seminar is just to be more aware as an architect. I'm a director of production on a team. Mm -hmm. But the, but the thing that I would have is like a. a the challenging situation that I face in my company, in my sector for the K-12, is that they is so well accepted for certain uh, MEPs, people, right? New generation, the old school, it's so difficult to sell these kind of things. And at the same time, in my division of the design people, they are gonna be a little bit more and like uh, you are talking to them in Japanese, so they can understand the whole spectrum because I would say 30% of the population in design is still remain designing on the SketchUp. 
knowing mm -hmm. Revit. So I have been just struggling then to force them, to train them, to get into the to the Revit uh, mode, right? And now yes, that and I'm doing a, on my side a, a seminar for a Dynamo, all the the comput computational design process that is on, is the future is right now reality and uh, you can prove it <laughs> with this <laughs> exhibition a very nice exhibition of the uh, uh, thermodynamics uh, uh, evolution of the project and multiple options and uh, you did it with one of the best sites that we have here in texas in houston uh, for that big monster that we don't know what's going to happen with the 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 astrodome and, yes, sir. Uh, and across the street used to be six flat and they knock it out to do the project development for housing and it's been almost 12 years and nothing happened on that site it's only growing grass and I, coming back to the to the to the uh, astrodome uh, we're trying to struggle in and i was working before in another company trying to do those design intents to preserve that building and rehab uh, uh the site to support the NFL stadium next door and for more parking and a more environmental uh, uh, green parks like uh, the, the Jones Brown Center in downtown. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm bringing like uh, the new Galleria Metropolitan Shopping Center, like uh, you were mentioning. It's a fantastic project that you just presented. And this technology is the one who's going to be more feasible uh, investor to get into it. Designers yeah. like me and many others are going to be on all the way through. But the thing is, uh, how much is the reality? How much money I have to put? And how much is the one thing that is going to be the revenue back? These applications, this methodology is the one that sell point for investors. Cool. And, right. uh, I'm so great. glad that you, that I, I cross path with you guys, and uh, I'm going to keep on pushing. And uh, you might have my email. And yesterday, I know the last week, I present because I passed you for the first session. Mm -hmm. And I photocopy one information that any one of your team send me and uh, to contact the the, medica, the mechanical engineer that we have that uh, uh, he has been deployed for three weeks or four, four weeks in California because we have offices in California or he's doing something in California, but he's going to come back. So as soon as he comes back, I'm going to be sharing with him the video clip of the first session this one that you eventually going to be sending to me and the third one for the plumbing one that you are uh, announcement correct excellent yes i'm i'm so fully on it <laughs> and uh, and uh, you have a partner here in this company who's going to be pushing for not only okay. eventually right. have the consulting service for you but as well the as soon everything the covid come up uh, to come back and uh, and do a launch and learn for these people so they can see what i have seen and, uh, and designers, designers are going to be just motivated for this computational design process. I have a brand new generation of kids who just graduated this past uh, uh, December, and, uh, and they are going to be the one who's going to be supporting my crazy idea. I'm 49 years old, but I, I, I've been working on this kind of level of the beam since 1993 when I was in college doing a vector works and what is just known as an Archicad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I know all of this, uh, 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 all this stuff since then. Finally, make it through the other side of the river, PC. <laughs> uh, when I would have bought a digraphos, a, a stock market, and we get a lot of uh, stuff from Vectorworks, Navis, uh, no nice word, Vectorworks, and this one, uh, uh, Minica. Minica was the first name, and then it turned to Vectorworks. And mm -hmm. it's a parallel brother of the big brother is a, is a, out of the a, Archicad. So all of this technology finally made it into the side of the river with a PC because I was Macintosh and I convert when I moved from Colombia to here in 99. And uh, I still remind all the knowledge that I got what I was doing in college in, in, out of, in, in Macintosh. Right. <laughs> Sorry to, to be the, the, the dinosaur guys calling the truth, but uh, like I have a joke in here, I was not uh, I, I was not raised with PC, I was raised with Mac. Got it. <laughs> Thank well, you for the chat. Thank you for your statements. This is great. Um, I just to let you know, I actually do live here in Houston, and uh, for me and Luke, this is going to be our little our, our baby. <laughs> um, we are working on a conceptual design for the Astro Dome as well as the entire site. So you know, get in contact with us at any time once things open up. Let's meet up. 
and uh, continue this conversation. Um, we really absolutely. do. Absolutely. 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 Uh, 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 feel free to uh, send me an email for more invitation uh, if one to one or, or meeting up afterwards because sure. I'm very into. I'm very into that thing, man. Thank you. All right. Cool. Thank you, Carlos. I really appreciate the feedback. No problem. Later. Thank you, sir. All right, guys. Well, we'll keep it open. Um, you know, while while all you guys are on here, feel free to speak up. Um, but that's that's all we have. So, uh, again, open up for questions. Uh, type in the chat box, or just go ahead and speak up, and we'll we'll just hang on until the room clears out. Looks like it's dying down. Just again, thank you everybody for coming. Really, really appreciate it. All you guys uh, joining and being attentive. All right, guys. Well, it looks like there's just two left and um, may not be attentive anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and shut this down. Thank you again, everybody, if you're still on.